Yes, good afternoon from Tokyo and welcome to the online webinar by the JICA Ogata Sadako Research Institute for Peace and Development. Uh, my name is uh, Ryutaro Murutani. I'm serving now serving as uh, I am I have a pleasure of moderating uh, today's webinar and I am serving as a, a senior director for the office for peace building now but more importantly for today's webinar I was serving as a head of uh, office for development partnership when I was uh, promoting uh, the JICA's South South and Triangular Corporation as well as uh, working on how to enhance the effectiveness of triangular cooperation. So, that, uh, so that's where, where I met a lot of colleagues from uh, development partners from Asia, uh, particularly from Southeast Asia. So today we have a pleasure of having uh, three uh, scholars uh, from the region. Uh, Mr. Huang from uh, Vietnam, and Mr. Herma Wang from Indonesia and Ms. Siripong uh, from Thailand. Each of them will present uh, their country's experiences on South-South and Triangular Cooperation. And then followed by uh, Dr. Siripong's uh, presentation on the ASEAN Centrality uh, in Development Cooperation. So we are looking forward uh, to this conversation. So, without further ado, I would like to invite first a colleague from uh, JICA Research Institute, uh, Shiga Hiroaki-san, uh, who will uh, give us an opening remarks. Shiga-san, please. Okay, uh, Murata-san, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And good morning, good evening, and hello to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, okay, th thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar. So my name is Hiroaki Shiga. I'm an executive senior research fellow of uh, JICA Ogata Sadako Research Institute for Peace and Development. It's a long day. And I'm honored uh, to welcome all of you to our webinar on the changing landscape of development cooperation in Southeast Asia. I'm so happy to have an audience from various countries with various affiliations. Today, we are going to present the preliminary result of the joint research uh, organized by JICA Research Institute under the umbrella of Policy Research Network on Contemporary Southeast Asia, jointly hosted by the groups of Japan, RSIS of Singapore, and CSIS of Indonesia. So taking advantage of this occasion, I would like to express my sincere gratitude uh, for Professor Shinoda of GRIPS, who kindly extended support for today's webinar. Also, my special thanks goes to my three colleagues in our joint research team, namely Dr. Huang of Vietnamese Academy of Social Science, Dr. Herma Wan of uh, Parashangan Catholic University, and Dr. Siripon of Tamasat University, who uh, kindly spared their precious time for today's webinar for presentation. So now let me uh, move on to my brief presentation about the background and the objectives of today's research, uh, uh, today's uh, our joint research project. So I would share with you my presentation material. Can you see it? Okay, thank you, thank you so much. So, uh, the starting point, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. The starting point of our research was the recognition that the landscape of development cooperation in Southeast Asia is changing. And the driver for this change is the intensification of great power rivalry. Among others, uh, the rivalry between China and the United States. And as a result, uh, the development cooperation here, by saying development cooperation, I mean both the ODA, Official Development Assistance, by uh, advanced countries or uh, OECD DAC countries, and also the South South cooperation provided by the Southern providers of aid. And development cooperation is increasingly employed as a tool or even a weapon for a great power diplomacy. And unfortunately for ASEAN countries, ASEAN region or 
more broadly, the Indo-Pacific region is the main battlefield of uh, great power competition, where regional cooperation initiatives, such as Belt and Road Initiatives, so the FOIP and BIMSTIC, are overlapping and competing. And it seems that uh, COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating this uh, existing trend. We are wit uh, witnessing increasingly assertive China. They are uh, deploying the mask and vaccine diplomacy or health silk road. And in response, the Biden administration is now renewing its commitment for this region. Recently, uh, President Joe Biden said in the interim national security strategic guidance that America is back, diplomacy is back, alliance is back. So against this background, it seems to me that ASEAN countries are facing both challenges and opportunities. What are the challenges? Well, first and foremost, leaders of ASEAN countries worry that Sino-US confrontation in the region will endanger the expected coming of the prosperous Asian century. And another challenge for the region is that ASEAN centrality or the ownership of ASEAN countries in drawing the blueprint of regional development architecture is under threat. And some even worry that donor-driven aid by extra regional power would increase. But at the same time, great power rivalry also provides opportunities for ASEAN countries. It may be an opportunity for them to gain momentum to gain momentum for the reinvigoration of South-South cooperation by intra-regional emerging donors like Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, or Vietnam, and to enhance the cross or closer cooperation among them. Maybe the main form of this cross cooperation would be the triangular South-South cooperation. And this is a form of South-South cooperation in which two donors and one recipient would participate. For example, Thailand may and can extend South-South cooperation to Laos or Cambodia in close cooperation with other ASEAN countries like Singapore or Malaysia. Also, it may be an opportunity for ASEAN countries to consolidate the lessons of their own unique socioeconomic development. So far, their experience of rapid economic, socioeconomic development are yet fully understand, uh, understood and left under theorized. So there is much room for them to consolidate their lessons. And we can find two encouraging factors. One is quite obvious. We are now witnessing the rise of inter-regional emerging donors. This is the main theme of today's presentation by three of my colleagues. And also, uh, ASEAN countries are the best performers in containing the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me elaborate on this point. So here is the COVID performance index developed by Rowe Institute in Australia. You can see that among top 10 best performers, we can find the name of Vietnam and Thailand. And generally speaking, ASEAN countries are doing quite well, even better than Japan or any other advanced countries like the United States, Germany, or France. And here I would like to draw your attention to the fact that as pointed out by Professor Sakiko Fukuda Pao of New School in the city of New York in the United States, that many developing countries, including ASEAN countries, effectively contained the pandemic without, without having the abundance of technological assets and financial resources, which were available to 
advanced country. So my, my expectation is that this would change or even reverse the existing vertical flow of knowledge in development cooperation. Let me elaborate on this. We tend to assume that lessons, technologies, institutions, or even norms flow only vertically or one-sidedly from so-called advanced countries like United States, Japan, Germany, or France to developing countries. But Corona pandemic revealed that Thailand or Vietnam or other ASEAN countries have something, something good. I don't know what it is, what they are, but still they have something good, which is fundamentally lacking in the United States, in Japan or in European countries. So there is much room for ASEAN countries to draw their own lessons, draw their own lessons in containing the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, okay. So bearing that in mind, these are the objectives of our joint research program. One is to shed light on the realities of development cooperation in ASEAN region. This is the starting point. We have to grasp the realities, facts. So today we would uh, delve deeper into this point. And second is to analyze the activities of intra-regional emerging donors like Thailand, Indonesia, or Vietnam under comparative theoretical framework. And to investigate what are the unique resources these interregional emerging donors can mobilize, including the reasons in containing successfully the COVID-19 pandemic. And to lastly, to elicit policy implications for the reinvigoration of South-South cooperation by interregional emerging donors and to enhance closer cooperation among themselves in this region. Okay, so this is uh, the list of uh, researchers who kindly joined our uh, our joint project, and today we invited only uh, Dr. Juan, Dr. Siripon, and Dr. Herumawan. And I'm very, very sorry for being unable to invite Dr. Juita Muhammad and Dr. Dr. Kai because of the very limited time available for this webinar. But uh, I'm planning to organize another webinar after we have completed this uh, joint research project. OK, so my presentation is not the main dish of today's webinar. So I should refrain from, from uh, wasting too much time. So thank you so much for your attention. And Murata-san, please invite uh, Dr. Juan for the first presentation. OK, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Shigasa, for your kind introductory remarks, and that gives us a very good uh, uh, guidance to, to today's webinar. So each of the Can presenters, you, uh... please uh, limit uh, your presentation into 15 minutes. So first, uh, I'm going to invite Mr. Huang from Vietnam. Mr. Huang, please. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Taro and uh, Professor Shiga. Uh, it's very obvious that uh, Professor Shiga have uh, um, elaborated very clearly the objective of the uh, research projects. And now we are going to discuss about um, the changing landscape of ODI in ASEAN, in South Asia, most uh, mostly focusing on uh, South South cooperation, as um, professors like us. Uh, uh, intended towards that uh, the main aim of the projects and I'm being asked to um, present my paper on uh, uh, changing landscape of ODI in South Asia as a case of Vietnam but uh, I'm uh, being asked to focus more on Vietnam South South cooperation to neighboring countries uh, in my presentation I uh, <clears throat> I am going to um, 
to talk on three main points. The first, uh, I would give some very brief overviews of inward audio in Vietnam. And second, I discuss more detail on um, our work, Vietnam award ODA in um, uh, aspect of South-South cooperation of Vietnam toward neighboring countries. And finally, I would like to give some concluding remarks and uh, some recommendation for enhancing South-South cooperation. Uh, the first point is that uh, in World Outdoor in Vietnam, and uh, we know that Vietnam started no more in 1986. And after then, that many ODI become important source for Vietnam development. In my presentation, in my paper, I also have mentioned quite uh, detail about the numbers of um, ODA and non-refundable and refundable and concession loans into Vietnam. I am not going to detail to give detail about this in my presentation. But I am um, just uh, uh, going to talk some of the main points that, that during the time in started in 1993, mostly 1993 to 2019, that uh, the ODI into Vietnam can be divided into two phases. First phase is a boom period in, from 1990 to 2015. And that shows that many ODIs and from many donors have um, given ODI to Vietnam as it plays very important role for Vietnam socioeconomic development during the time. And to have Vietnam uh, improve infrastructures and social and institution in Vietnam. And second pass, phase is a bus period after 19, 2015, that's uh, uh, because Vietnam also become the middle income countries and the inward of ODI into Vietnam in following the downward trend. Um, during that uh, period of many the donor, key donors uh, providing provided ODI to Vietnam is that one buying ADB uh, con consider as bilateral donors and Japan, South Korea, China, and other countries as uh, um, 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 bilateral uh, uh, cooperation donors to Vietnam. And uh, we, sh we, we think that China, Japan and South Korea is very important donors that have Vietnam is process of reforming economy and developing social economics landscape in Vietnam during that almost 20 years, last 20 years, starting from 1990 to recent year. And it shows that even now that uh, the trend of ODA into Vietnam is downward, uh, but we know that the help from um, Japan and other countries like South Korea and Won Bang and OADB and other country in EU also play a very important role. Uh, so now I think that there not only the changing landscape, Vietnam emerging from ODA reserve to ODA providers. I'm going to discuss in two cases that Vietnam provides that some assistance to Laos and Cambodia, but it's not you know, happened to me that that's a changing landscape after Vietnam uh, receiving less ODA, but also during Vietnam receiving uh, uh, many ODA from donors. Also, Vietnam provides some assistance to neighboring countries, especially to Laos and Cambodia. Um, especially when Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia formed the de development jungle in early 2000s. And that one is the main institution that paves the way for cooperation among three countries and also uh, receiving a lot of attention from other countries like Japan and uh, uh, Japan and um, South Korea. In Vietnam, ODA to Laos, that um, before talking about that. Uh, that the cooperation be between Vietnam and Laos, and I, 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 uh, we, we, we know that Laos has long been one of the most political strategic partners of Vietnam. So leadership could be for the independent from French colonial rules. And from that, that we have very close relationship between, between the two countries. And when the Laos also opening up its economy, Vietnam become the most important source of FDI into Laos. And at present that Vietnam is ranked third among 
FDI provider in Laos with 409 projects and with total raised capital of 4.1 billion US dollars after China and Thailand. And besides FDI, Vietnam is also a, a important ODI provider to Laos, but it argues that there has been very little known about the pattern of Vietnam's ODI to Laos so far. Um, even uh, before the Doi Moi, before Vietnam uh, implementing that uh, reform policies, Vietnam assistance to Laos was in the form of non-refundable aid. After Doi Moi, since 1986, the pattern of ODI to Laos has gradually changed to development cooperation. Moreover, the ODI project provided by Vietnam has gradually shifted from cooperation according to programs and plans side between the two governments. And although there is no available data, on size and Vietnam ODA for Laos, the pattern of the age can be seen from sector GC has received the most ODA from Vietnam, include agriculture, infrastructure, education, and training and health sectors. Um, in um, in um, infrastructure, Vietnam have provided non-refundable aid to build military facilities for. Uh, In agriculture and rural development fields, Vietnam also have provided a lot of grant to and technical cooperation to help Laos development of agriculture and rural areas. Vietnam provides agricultural equipment and machine to Laos under the two government cooperation agreements. During 2001 and 2007, Vietnam DA fund for seven food security programs in three provinces of Laos, Vientiane, Champasak and Atapu, and three irrigation system in Vientiane and Hua Phan provinces accounted for about, about 20% of total ODA funds from Vietnam to Laos. And in the field of infrastructure development over the last three decades, physical infra infrastructure was one of the most important sectors in bilateral economic cooperation between Vietnam and Laos. Many major roads, railways, and border gates have been completed and upgraded such as National Road Number 43 of Laos, connecting Mok Chau of Vietnam to Pahang, Water Gate of Laos, and Road 6B in Hoa Phan province of Laos, connecting and Cầu Chau and Nam Pha Water Gate, and National Road 12A from Chalo Water Gate in Quảng Bình province to Kham Muôn province of Laos, Road 18 Brigade in Laos, and Vietnam provided aid to build Na Kong airport and most recently new national assembly buildings. In educa education sectors, also educating sectors very important role as key sectors in Vietnam in to Laos. During the early period of Doi Moi, in 1986 to 1992, hundreds of Lao Chien postgraduate and graduate was trained and graduated from Vietnam school and universities. In 1992, Vietnam and Laos signed agreement on training of Lao cadres in Vietnam. In 1997, Vietnam expanded assistance to Laos in the sector to major channels, including long-term and formal training courses for Laos students, short-term training and retraining courses for Laos cadres. As a result, many high-quality human resources of Laos have been trained and educated by Vietnam to ODIs. In health sectors, it's very important sectors got assistance from Vietnam. Two of the largest health infrastructure projects in Laos supported by Vietnam have been friendship hospital and the whole fund friendship hospital projects with total fund of the first of the Sien Quang friendship hospital in about 17.6 uh, million US dollars and 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 whole fund hospital cost about 20 million US, US dollars that is source of non-refundable aid from Vietnam is, is considered its largest ever sum of Vietnamese government have granted to Laos before building that National Assembly 
building of Laos. Uh, about Vietnam, uh, Odia to Cambodia, so, so Vietnam Cambodia relation is very important and thriving over the years, especially uh, despite uh, some up and down uh, relationship between, between the two countries. As of now, 2018, Vietnam has 214 investment projects in Cambodia with total registered capital of over 3.3 billion US dollars, ranking among the top five countries with the largest investment capital in Cambodia. Similar to the case of Laos, the pattern of Vietnam ODA to Cambodia has not been much explored due to lack of data. Despite the pattern can be assessed from Vietnam major aid infrastructure, education and training and health sectors. Also Vietnam has provided non refundable aid to build military facility for Cambodia. In 2015, the inaugurated chief in Cambodia is from Pen. As a funding cost of about 240,000 US dollars to build officer training school headquarters with two story building in Kapong Spu province. Uh, and besides that, assets to build border infrastructure, border market, also given by Vietnam ODA is. For example, the Dam Market, the company's first ever border market in Thari Bank Khamun, is special economic zone in Cambodia, about one kilometer from the nearest Cambodia Vietnam border, with a grant of two million US dollars. In education and training, Vietnam has provided annual about 200 scholarships for Cambodian students. To be specific, Vietnam funding to Cambodia in this sector from 2001 to 2010 was about uh, 619 billion US dollars, about uh, uh, close to 30 um, million uh, US dollars, a quick period. Uh, it divided, divided into different uh, periods, but it proves that uh, education and training is very important uh, sectors that uh, receive uh, assistance from Vietnam. Uh, also, Vietnam have uh, provided uh, assistance to train to graduate uh, many um, cadres for uh, Cambodian government, especially to improving human resources and help Cambodia to attract the most uh, uh, Cambodian students into Vietnamese uh, university and school, especially. in the uh, and universities means that there was close relationship between the two countries during um, the last three decades after Vietnam uh, opening up economy on the uh, uh, in, in the health sector also Vietnam as is building from pain hospital during 2001 to 2010 Vietnam provide about three million US dollars for building the uh, is a hospital in Cambodia, and also to train doctors and nurses and to equip health facilities. Dr. Huang, uh, can, recently, you, can you finish yes, in yes, two yes, minutes? Yes, uh, yeah, we are very short now. Yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah, I'm going to end it. Yeah, recently, during the COVID-19 pandemic, Vietnam have allowed San Cambodia to fight against COVID-19 with medical supply, including hundreds of thousands of masks, gear, gloves, and hand sanitizer the infectants and real time PCR testing kits and also donate uh, uh, for each country some uh, money uh, to help to uh, fight against COVID. And also Vietnam said a plan for better 2021 to 2022 include to carry out survey for building up a less about the market between two countries and to run activity to encourage Vietnam and Cambodia businessmen to invest in broader trade infrastructure increase related trade investment promotion even and to support firms introducing disturbing distributing goods and border market in central trade centers and budget buyer and uh, i would like to give some uh, conclude recommendation that um, despite the measures also economic difficulties and challenges uh, 
Sindomo Vietnam has seen to provide aid and assistance to Laos and Cambodia. And to, uh, for our world ODA, I think that Vietnam will take active role in assisting neighboring countries with effective and valuable funding for infrastructure, connectivities, education and training, and health and medical sectors to be in collaboration among Indochina countries. For starting development and cooperation in the CLV development chamber for promoting South South cooperation, co part support from other countries like Japan, South Korea, US, and other countries for promoting not South South cooperation and to build Indochina as strong and as more close relationship among countries in Indochina region. Thank you so much. Because as a time constraint, I uh, uh, I would like to end my presentation here. I expect you. to get some uh, questions from uh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Juan. Uh, we already got some some three questions, uh, but uh, let me let us discuss this uh, later on. And please, uh, for the audience, please give us uh, the, your questions in the Q and A section. So now we move on to the presentation from Indonesia, uh, Dr. Hermawan. Uh, so I give you 15 minutes again, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the 15 minutes. Uh, hopefully we can manage the presentation within a uh, such limited time. Well, uh, let me uh, share my power presentation first. Uh, I cannot share, unfortunately. Uh, if the host can uh, allow me to go host, then I can share the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Dr. Dr. Huang, can you stop uh, sharing the presentation? Yeah, I tried to do it, but uh, let me how to do it. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Great, okay. it's coming. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, Mr. Murotari Yutaro, thank you very much this, for this uh, 15 minutes. Uh, allow me to share now. Yeah. Uh, okay, first of all, I would like to thank you to uh, Siga Sensei for inviting me to participate in this research and I think we share uh, the same agreement that cooperation between emerging donors in Southeast Asia is very important. Uh, we are aware about the competition between uh, say Indonesia and Thailand and Vietnam uh, which, is, which must be not good for the development of uh, regional integration and, uh, and the idea of having cooperation among the researchers in the region is uh, uh, very much appreciated. And my responsibility is uh, to share about the new landscape. Uh, well, actually, this the new idea of having a newly modified uh, internal framework uh, to better delivery, to better implementation of initial cooperation. Uh, uh, yeah. So, what I would like to present is basically about Indonesia's experience in uh, the establishment of Indonesian aid and uh, this quite new development. And yeah, uh, we are starting back to share, and uh, hopefully uh, we can take and draw lessons. What what is important for other emerging donors in the region, and even though this is very domestic issue, but we do believe that uh, the promotion of regional cooperation will be very uh, hopefully will be will be enhanced uh, by the establishment of the right effective institutional framework. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, here is the uh, very proud moment of Indonesia uh, progress in also as an emerging uh, donor, as managing provider of international development cooperation. The launch of Indonesian Agency for International Development, uh, we call it Indonesian Aid. And my uh, focus of the research uh, is how has Indonesia developed uh, a transformative international framework, which is called Indonesian Aid, to address. Uh, the challenge as an emerging provider of uh, uh, international development cooperation. The problem might be common, but the way emerging donors uh, address the problem might be different and will be good to share this. So there are four points I would like to share with you. Uh, the first is the rationale behind the establishment of 
the Indonesian aid. Uh, the second is the limitation that unfortunately uh, faced by uh, by a national coordinating team of, of short, short cooperation in Indonesia here. That eventually they have to adapt uh, or to find the, the right uh, form of the institution. And then we, are, we will look at the structure, function, function, and working procedures. And then at the end of the presentation, I will throw some lesson learned, nine lesson learned, which, is, uh, which are very important. Okay. Let's start with the rational why Indonesia established Indonesian aid. Uh, uh, yeah, this is the summary of the rational. Then I can go one by one, uh, a bit detail, but not too detail. First, uh, the idea of helping uh, Indonesian aid is. Uh, it, it seems very important because we need to address magnitude of challenge of the social uh, and cooperation. And this is actually the reflection by a uh, uh, national coordinating team of social and triangle cooperation in 2015 and 2016. So there were discussions, very intensive discussions among the pillars of this NCC STC. Uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of course, to mention it, Ministry of Finance, uh, Ministry of State Secretariat, uh, State Secretariat, and also Ministry of National Development Planning. That uh, the challenge was very huge, and uh, and then they come to the conclusion that one key policy is imperative to enhance innovation performance in uh, delivering uh, social cooperation, social and triangular cooperation. Then, when we talk about the one key policy, we recognize the importance of having single agency. That's the basic idea. So what are the challenges? Many. And uh, I put here seven out of many challenges. The first is uh, looking at the expression of Indonesia, and I guess uh, with uh, uh, the same experience with Thailand, Vietnam. The, there are so many different ministries and institutions that implement uh, different programs of social and triangular cooperation. And this affects a difficult coordination. And those the effectiveness of the program to be the clear national policy is uh, also as difficult as coordination itself. Uh, it's not like an legal framework; it's still lagging. Uh, we have it, but it's, we we, uh, we have to recognize it's still very weak. Less authority, uh, not strong uh, regulation uh, because it's uh, because it's based on the uh, ministerial uh, regulation, uh, but not a uh, government regulation, which higher than uh, ministerial decree. Uh, the weak monitoring and evaluation mechanism for better implementation has to be recognized as a uh, real challenge. Uh, the budget compatibility issues, because it was implemented by different ministry, then come how could we know the total budget of, uh, of innovation, social, and triangle cooperation? Of course, uh, there are so many demands, but the fund is very limited, uh, unfortunately, because we have to depend on the state budget. Difficulty to run the multi year program. Because we cannot do that. The state, uh, the state budget uh, clearly said that uh, it can only be used within one fiscal year. And then the, sometimes, or actually quite often, the long distance of grant for humanitarian assistance, uh, including if we are talking about the grants for uh, uh, dealing with or tackling uh, the pandemic, COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. Yeah, uh, I can inform you, uh, luckily, because we have Indonesian aid, then we can provide grants for Afghanistan, Palestine, around uh, 10 billion uh, rupiah, which is quite a lot actually in Indonesian money. Uh, Fiji, uh, Solomon Island, uh, Papua New Guinea, and Timor Leste. Uh, and without, without delaying, so in the same fiscal year, that's what I heard from Indonesian aid. Now look at, uh, Look, look, look at more detail about uh, Rasun. Everybody knows, and here in Indonesia, we know uh, Indonesia is now uh, upper middle income country. It was lower middle income country. And because we have agreed our status as, uh, as a, a middle income country, then come the moral responsibility. Uh, yes, yes, uh, and we are very pleased to share with uh, other developing countries how we manage uh, of the development aid in the past. Uh, we would like to share with other developing countries about the best practices in addressing uh, so many different issues. Uh, and hopefully, the lesson from Indonesia can help other developing countries. That's the basic idea. So this is the new moral obligation for Indonesia to help other developing, developing and developing countries to share good lessons and 
provide technical cooperation. Uh, different kind of flexi program we have always already uh, seven at least uh, from 2011 to 2014 agriculture disaster and risk management democracy and good governance trade and industry infrastructure human development and population development and since 2015 we categorize with all program into three uh, we call it flexi program which are development issue economic issue good government peace uh, and peace building now, of course in 2020 still and here are all the data yeah, that we have uh, not precise data. This already published uh, uh, every year in the annual report. Uh, this is a good thing uh, from having national coordinating team. Um, 26 program in 2014, uh, 70 program in 2019, which is uh, quite uh, quite a lot, yeah. with uh, around 1,300 participants from 134 countries, beneficiary countries. Uh, mostly uh, uh, addressing the development issue. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, here are the top beneficiary countries, uh, members of ASEAN definitely in the list Myanmar, Timor Leste, Vietnam, Laos, uh, Philippines, Ma uh, Malaysia in 2014. Uh, 2015, we have Timor Leste and Myanmar. Uh, 2019, we have Timor Leste, Laos, Philippines, Myanmar, Vietnam. Of course, uh, uh, Myanmar and Timor Leste. Is are always in the list, in our list, uh, looking at uh, the importance of ASEAN centrality. Uh, but we also provide uh, support for Afghanistan and Palestine. They, we, we found uh, they are very important partner, uh, beneficiary partner for Indonesia. Uh, tra training, the great programs, the workshops, workshop, uh, so many uh, activities. Uh, also uh, quite important to highlight is the type of the cooperation. Social cooperation, which means supported fully by the state budget, or triangle cooperation, triangle cooperation which is uh, uh, supported in cooperation with uh, traditional donors. Uh, uh, we are very happy to have support from uh, Germany, uh, from Japan, from the United States, from Australia, working together to deliver uh, social cooperation with beneficiary countries. So if you look at this number, 2019, the, uh, more and more uh, reliant on state budget, I think it's very evident here. 63% uh, uh, I think uh, social cooperation, while uh, single cooperation is uh, around 37%. Uh, okay, next, uh, here is the issue. Yeah. Who are implement the program? 23 ministries. Around five uh, center of excellence. Actually, the number is more, higher, more and more, lot. Uh, here's, here's what the national coordinating team can uh, can identify. Also, state-owned enterprises, uh, private sector, NGOs, many. You see that. So this comes the issue when national coordinating team evaluate. There, we need a more stronger institutional framework. Uh, question is, what kind of framework? What kind of institution? Uh, look at the timeline of the making of institutional framework. I think it has been uh, really serious. Uh, the government already really committed in 1967 when it became the recipient at the time. And once we uh, Indonesia is uh, Indonesia was the largest recipient of official development uh, aid uh, from traditional donors. Uh, 1981 we uh, we start to begin uh, to prove uh, begin to provide technical cooperation, and it was responsibility of Ministry of State Secretariat. And then 2005, um, MOVA uh, began uh, to be more serious, to be more committed, strongly to organize the social cooperation, uh, direct authentic cooperation was established. And then uh, 2011, the policy on social cooperation was integrated into national development planning and come the commitment to have a specific uh, institutional framework, which is a national coordinating team of social cooperation, indeed. Of course, uh, national development, uh, um, so Ministry of National Development Planning was also responsible for this. So, director of IDC was established within uh, Bapernas. You see, we have at least four ministries who were committed uh, uh, to implement uh, social cooperation. Uh, in 2016 and 2018, uh, there was a discussion about how we would prepare for having first uh, uh, one single uh, one gate policy on social cooperation, and then single agency to implement uh, single, uh, the one gate policy. Uh, it takes quite a while until the end of 2019, eventually Indonesian aid was launched. And, uh, and I would like to say that this is not the final format of the institution. 
because uh, not really a single agility yet, but this is good a kind of exercise to have uh, institution fully responsible for implementing one gate policy. That's the key point. Okay, uh, this uh, four pillars, I think already mentioned about this. This is the structure. Of course, uh, there is uh, there is a commitment also by NCT uh, to establish stronger uh, coordinations uh, between different ministries, specifically uh, that we did. So in the end, you know, uh, uh, the rationale behind the establishment of Indonesian is, uh, Indonesian aid is come of the recognition of the magnitude of the challenge that we have, we face face in the implementation of SDC. But the problem is, in 2016-2017, here's what was the issue. The government, the president, did not allow it, did not allow the formation of the new institution. Quite unfortunately, you see uh, uh, here, the, uh, this one is information uh, taken from the Ministry of State Apparatus uh, Empowerment, which says, avoid the information of new institution. Well, why? already too many institutions, not really efficient, not really effective, but cost a lot, uh, state budget. 34 ministries, 29 non-ministerial government institutions, four state apparatus, 99 non-structural non institutions. So I can tell you, uh, in 2006, the discussion, the discussion was, uh, Indonesian aid could take form at either non-ministerial government institution or non-structural institution. Uh, because uh, we need uh, an agency uh, just like JICA or CIZ or USAID, which has uh, authority to plan, implement, monitor, and evaluation. Yeah, uh, should be autonomous, uh, should be autonomous, independent, and also um, uh, has uh, has competence to increase the funding. Uh, uh, and we found uh, these two kind of uh, format of the institution is the only option. But unfortunately, uh, the limitation is 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 uh, is indeed uh, 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 this all pillars of the entity should should respect. Con cannot take a form as uh, LPNK we call it or LNS. Unfortunately, then here. Uh, there's a, there was a discussion again whether what actually Indonesia need is stronger NCT of SSC or still continuing discussion on different kind of institution. So eventually we have the idea to have Indonesian aid as public service agency. Uh, what's the difference between uh, this and the previous ideas? Of course, uh, this agency is uh, uh, possible. Uh, it, uh, but the problem is uh, it should be established within the Ministry of Finance. But, but this is quite interesting after the discussion. Eventually, uh, there was an uh, idea to have this institution should be within the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs because MOFA clearly uh, by the law has responsibility for diplomacy and also social cooperation and other things. And also they are responsible for the policy and its implementation. But there was also the limit, unfortunately about the budget, it will affect the budget system within the ministry. So uh, back to the Ministry of Finance, which is possible. And, and, and of course, uh, the issue is it has limited authority as well, which is more on the financing of funding and investment, that's the issue. So the legal framework, uh, I will try yes, to- Dr. Hevon, we are yeah. running out of time. So please go quickly, two minutes. Two minutes, two yes. minutes. Uh, Will be not enough, but anyway, I, I just <laughs> yeah, thank you. quickly tell you. Uh, so the basic idea in the end is uh, it focuses on the financing issues. It is responsible how to raise more funding, so Indonesia can meet the demand, demand which increase from time to time, including from the ASEAN uh, fellow members. That's the idea. The responsibility of this uh, Indonesian aid, but the question: Who is responsible for the implementation? Here are the issues. But uh, I think we can make better still. So look at this, this one. Who are the key stakeholders? Of course, Indonesian is is only one out of two, at least, of four stakeholders in Indonesian aid. Of course, uh, the focus in the financing issues. Uh, the policy is still in the hand of uh, MOFA, Minister of Foreign Affairs. And here is the good idea. MOFA has responsibility for the appraisal and proper approval of the proposed program activity. And this is a good thing because MOFA can ensure that all programs 
implemented by different ministry will be in line with the policy, the grand policy. Because we have implementing ministry and also, also foreign government and foreign institution that receive funds. What lesson learned? Of course, we have uh, so many challenges and still good to have Indonesian aid. And this Indonesian head must cooperate with a uh, uh, working group under responsibility of Ministry of Foreign, Foreign Affairs. And this is good to ensure one good policy. One good policy. Indeed, uh, of course, you can look at my portfolio. Uh, uh, if you would like to quote, then plus, just let me know because it's still in the process. Uh, and of course, it's good uh, because uh, we have institution which is responsible for the funding, nursing funding. Yeah, uh, and of course, this is good uh, within the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Budget accountability, which is very important. So, what what is the way forward, and what lesson can we uh, what lesson uh, ASEAN members other ASEAN members can learn? First, uh, the recently established Indonesian aid cannot be seen as the final format of the internal framework. It is not. We still have different stakeholders. In the long run, Indonesia will need one single institution that can fully implement one gate policy. One gate policy is now uh, uh, in the process of implementation, of course, because of Indonesian aid. Uh, but the single synod set, so not, set not only manage the financial issue, but also has authority to plan, execute, and monitor, and hold the program, including making the price of the proposed program. Uh, and we are thinking about JICA, we are thinking about CIS, we are thinking about USA. Uh, and of course, there is now a need to integrate the, the two key in, uh, entities and implementing agency into one single group management. But uh, at the moment, what we can say is let the new institutional framework to uh, proceed effectively, optimally. Yeah. So at least within, say, uh, five years, we will have really one good policy. Then we can start thinking about how to transform uh, the new institutional framework today with the new one, which is much more effective. And at the end of the day, of course, we will uh, be able to contribute to the uh, the uh, regional cooperation in source of cooperation, also in the broader term for uh, international development cooperation. So, last, you know, further reformation of Indonesia is clearly needed in the long in the long uh, term. Uh, Mr. Murotan, I think that's all uh, that I can say. And of course, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, you have the idea. And of course, it would be very uh, interesting to hear your response and inputs, uh, so I can uh, write better. You know. Our, thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Hermawan, and thank you for your understanding. And uh, people may have some questions, so we will have some Q&A session at the end of this uh, webinar. So let me invite uh, Dr. Siripong from uh, Tamasato University of Thailand, and uh, another 15 minutes, please, uh, for your presentation on Thailand. Yeah. Dr. Okay. Siripong, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I will go for a share screen. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Jaika and also uh, Chika Sensei for inviting me to join um, this um, project and also for this webinar today. Um, at this moment, I will talk about Thailand uh, first, and then maybe, uh, and then later, I will talk about the conclusion of uh, the findings of our project. Uh, for Thailand, I think uh, many of us already know that uh, you know Thailand had started the development cooperation policy uh, two decades ago. So what, what I'm going to focus today actually will focus on the second decades of our experience and see how uh, Thailand. Uh, improve or adjust her policy and also uh, to see the future that uh, Thailand will move forward as an active regional provider. Um, I actually will focus on the, you know, uh, the key frameworks and the key policy, uh, the details, for example, like uh, case study or statistic uh, will not be included uh, in this uh, presentation, but any of you, if you would like to follow, uh, you can see from my paper later. Uh, the outline of the presentation, I would 
I divided the presentation into two parts. Uh, first part, I will focus on, uh, you know, Thailand as a southern provider uh, by focusing on the challenges during the first decade. Uh, what is the policy direction or institutional arrangement that we have? Uh, then uh, I will move to the, um, the second part, focusing on uh, progress and achievement in the second decade. So we will see how Thailand adjusts her policy and also improve her delivery process uh, by, uh, you know, uh, through the lesson learned that they have, uh, that Thailand has in the, uh, in the first decade. And then uh, we also identify the challenges for the future, particularly the institutional reform that many people talk about these in our country, the impact assessment and the aid effective that effectiveness, which is not yet, uh, you know, done much in, in our uh, policy and also practice. Uh, the second part of my presentation will go to the, uh, Thailand as a driver for SSC in ASEAN Regional Development Cooperation. Um, in this paper, I focus just only on SSC and I do not include uh, TRC because I would like to focus on the intra uh, regional uh, cooperation, uh, mainly between ASEAN 6 uh, and also ASEAN 4 in the regional development cooperation policy. I will try to uh, talk a bit about uh, Thailand new, actually, actually it's not that new, but uh, you know, more active in uh, regional sub-regional cooperation that is AMEC, ATMEC. And I see these as a, a platform to promote South-South uh, cooperation uh, for the, the region. Um, the main, the objective of my study, actually, there are two objectives. The first one is to review the achievement, progress, and challenges of Thailand, Thailand's development cooperation policy and practice. And the second objective is to uh, discuss the possibility of Thailand's contribution to promote SSC at the regional level. Uh, the main argument, uh, we, I have two uh, arguments. The first one is that uh, although we see, uh, you know, the achievement um, in Thailand development cooperation policy during the second decade, uh, I still see that there are several challenges. Several challenges still continue, and of course, I think critical adjustment and improvement in terms of architecture and effectiveness are really need to increase efficiency and impact. The uh, second main argument is that um, regarding Thailand's contribution to promote SSC at the regional and sub-regional level, it is argued that Thailand is able to play a vital role to advocate SSC by two ways. First way is prioritizing regional cooperation as a channel for her aid delivery in order to scale up SSC at the regional level. Uh, because so far, I will show you later that so far, Thailand provide, uh, you know, development assistance through bilateral channel more than other channel, and so this lead to the question: How we are going to scale up, uh, you know, the regional cooperation? If you know Thailand uh, or even other countries, let's say Malaysia, Vietnam, still continue providing it through bilateral channel. Uh, second way, if Thailand can play a big role, is that provide leadership and facilities for regional coordination to increase efficiency and effectiveness and also impact. Um, the methodology that I applied because of, uh, you know, pandemic uh, during the past period, it's really difficult to conduct, the, let's say, the uh, interview or focus group uh, discussion. So mainly I use documents from Taika, from NEDA, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and our National Economics and Social Development Board. And of course, uh, some articles from others uh, scholar. Then this is the, the overview. Um, as you know, Thailand has been the uh, recipient for a long time. I mean, since uh, we start our economics uh, and social development plan in 1960s, but uh, by 2000, uh, our economy became uh, up to the, I mean, became developed and also uh, we, are, we became the middle income countries. And by 2003, this is the policy announcement by the government at that time that uh, Thailand, uh, would like to 
change our status. Of course, we still continue being recipient, but at the same time, we start providing uh, you know, assistance to our neighboring countries. Uh, the objectives by, by that time, there were three big objectives. First, we provide uh, development assistance to neighboring countries in order to strengthen our cordial relationship with uh, our neighboring countries, particularly those in uh, the Mekong sub-region. At the same time, uh, Thai government look at uh, you know, development uh, cooperation as the tools, instrument to expand our economics cooperation and also as a part of regional integration process. So another two main objectives for Taiwan to provide assistance to neighboring countries is to expand our economy at the same time to strengthen the regionalization process. And in order to implement these policy. Uh, Thai government by that time issued two decrees um, in 2004 and 2005 to establish uh, two, two organizations, that is Taika and also NIDA. Uh, Taika in 2004 and Taika in 2005. Uh, and actually, these two organizations are not the brand new organization. It's transformed from uh, the existing organization. Uh, in case of Taika, it transformed from DTEC. And NEDA, it uh, was transformed from uh, NEDF. And uh, the main function is that these two organizations change the, uh, you know, the function from uh, receiving and managing the invert ODA to providing ODA. The performance during the first decades, actually, uh, when we start providing assistance, we have all types of, uh, you know, assistance. We provide loan through NIDA. We provide grant and TC technical cooperation to Taika. Approaches, as I said, uh, because Thailand, uh, try to utilize um, development corporations as a power policy, as a part of foreign policy tool. So it means that we prefer the bilateral uh, approach so that we can negotiate much with our neighboring countries. For the modalities, we focus on you know, demand driven because this based on our experience as uh, being recipient in the past, we look at ownership of the project as the most important one. So we try to encourage our neighboring countries to be the owner of the project. So demand driven is our key ideas. And uh, at the beginning, because we still didn't have much budget to uh, you know, provide to neighboring countries. So um, the way that we work is project-based. And this uh, type changed uh, during the second decade. The destination, um, we look at our neighboring countries as the main destination, particularly Laos and Cambodia. Uh, the sector. I think Thailand share uh, the same uh, practice as other southern providers that we provide development assistance from the sector that we have strength, that is agriculture, ed education, and health. Uh, for the source of funding, because this is the initiative from the government, so the source of funding comes from the national budget. And it's it's interesting to observe that during the, the first decade, the terms and conditions for loan that we provide to neighboring country is uh, tight. We got conditions, you know, we, we uh, add condition for um, the receiving countries uh, to follow when we provide it. Observation. If you look at the, the way that we practice, uh, you will find that uh, first observation is this policy actually uh, initiated by, by the government. It is a political view. So when it is a political view, actually it's just sep it was separated from the national policy. This leads to the main challenges during the first decade. That is, there was no grand policy or strategy to uh, give the guidelines or the direction for this policy. And this also leads to the second observation that is the limited authority and functions of Taiga, because according to the decree in 2004, uh, the status of Taiga was only office under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And these also lead to the, the next observation, um, that is the limited coordination uh, function, coordination, uh, you know, uh, authority for both Taiga and NIDA with other line ministries. So it's mean that during that time, other line ministry also, uh, you know, provide their development assistance to other countries by their own budget, I mean, their own, uh, under their own capacity. So this leads to the second challenges, which is the, the big challenges. And I think we share these challenges with Indonesia, 
that is the architecture of Thailand uh, by that time it was really fragmented. There was almost 20 ministries that provide you know, uh, development assistance to neighboring countries. And at the same time, even though the government already created the organizations such as Taiga and NIDA, uh, these two organizations have limited capacity in terms of, uh, you know, uh, structure and also human resources. So this leads to the, uh, you know, the other challenges during the first decades, that is the impact assessment and effectiveness. By that time, um, the, the organization trying to focus more on the provision process and uh, you know, less attention uh, was given to the monitoring evaluation mechanism. Then when we go to the second decade, uh, in the second decade, what we see is that more progress and achievement has been done, have been trying to, you know, complete by both uh, NEDA and also Taiga. Uh, the first uh, challenge is that is no grand policy and strategy. Uh, this has been solved by both Taiga and NIDA. These two organizations try to integrate the, de the development cooperation policy, the development cooperation policy into the national policy. Particularly, we can see that in the National Economic and Social Development Plan number 12, and also the 20 years uh, National Strategic Plan, and also Ministry of Foreign Affairs Master Plan. So in all these plans, which are the you know the key plans and strategies of the country has identified at least one session one paragraphs about the development cooperation policy so in this sense it mean that all these you know uh plan provide guidelines direction for um the status of Thailand as the provider and also help uh these policy to be conducted in a way that aligned with the national policy. The architecture, this is also the big issue which has been discussed and has been continually discussed even by this time. Um, Taika tried to uh, you know, uh, make its status better or stronger by, uh, uh, ch by changing the status from uh, an office under Ministry of Foreign Affairs to be the department under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs through the cabinet resolution in 2015. This resolution actually support Taika to be a coordinating body. So Taika tried to, you know, uh, manage the, the whole picture of the whole policy of uh, development cooperation policy of the country. Then for NIDA, NIDA itself also uh, tried to justify its existence by making its own 20 years master plan so that NIDA can, you know, situate itself in the whole picture of development cooperation policy of the country and present itself as an alternative financial source for development, which is different from a commercial bank. Another point is line ministry. Of course, once the, the, uh, the development cooperation policy has been integrated into the national policy, the line ministry also realized that they also have to comply with the, the new way of practice. Then the point is that uh, because Taika become a coordinating body, Taika request all line ministry to report to Taika when line ministry provide, you know, assistance to developing countries. It's so difficult in Thailand as the, you know, uh, as a centralized country and compartmentalized uh, administrative system to ask line ministry to stop providing uh, development assistance to to uh, you know the uh, neighboring countries because they have their own authority, but it's possible to ask those ministry to report to Taika, and Taika can accumulate you know somehow the statistic to show that oh this is the whole uh, country the um, the whole budget that country provide to neighboring country. For for the practice, we can see some continuous continuity from the first decade to the second decade, and also the improvement in terms of uh, you know type of aid we continue provide loan, grant, and TC uh, by uh, loan through NIDA, grant, and TC to uh, Taika as in the first decade for the scope and scale. This is something which is improved uh, during the second decade. We see the increasing budget. If you go to the statistic, uh, 
in uh, by Taika and also Nida. I also show my statistic, show the statistic in my paper too. Uh, we see the average uh, of budget increase from 2,000 million baht during the first decade to 4,000 million baht. And this is somehow like, you know, double. So it sound, seems to be big for Thailand. Again, for the programs and projects, uh, during the first decade, for example, like Taiga provide it to several to seven channels, but uh, during the second t uh, second decades, Taika tried to consolidate it, make the program streamline it, seamless it, so make it more uh, consolidated. So when it uh, become consolidated, it means the, the channel come to just only four. It means for each channel, I mean each program, it can earn more, it can get more budget. So it makes the program, you know, somehow stronger. For the approach, what we see from the statistic is that, of course, bilateral is still the main approach for Thailand when uh, Thailand provides development assistance to neighboring countries. But at the same time, we also see that the amount of contributions to multilateral organization, particularly international organization, is increasing. But only multinational organization uh, for example, the statistic in 2018 still show that the uh, development assistance provided through regional framework is still very less. So I think that we see some improvement from the, you know, from bilateral approach to multilateral approach. But Dr. Sipun, can you speed up a little bit? We are running out of time. Yeah, Sorry. okay, I will try now. Yeah, okay. Uh, but it's still less for the regional uh, framework. So this is the, the issue that I will talk later when we talk about the, uh, you know, ASEAN uh, centrality. The modality, uh, we continue the demand driven and also pro uh, the program based, as I said, uh, we try to focus more on program based, not the project based. The destination, uh, this is something plus, this is something that we find some, uh, you know, improvement. Of course, it will be still uh, the main destination for us, but at the same time, we see that now Thailand provides assistance to Africa and South Asia. Uh, the most important part is that the emphasis on uh, SEP, the sufficient economy uh, philosophy. Uh, all programs, uh, I mean, all sector that we provide in the first decade, we continue. For example, like agriculture, health and education, but in all programs, we add the philosophy of self-sufficiency economy. So the funding, what we found is that NEDA in particular trying to find funding from other sources, not just only national budget. So the, uh, the factors just contribute to the progress and achievement. We found that uh, both external factors and internal factors uh, contribute to that. For the external factors, of course, the region, the SDG um, is the main issue, particularly is SDG number 17, that Thai government look at it and try to integrate it into the uh, our national policy. The second uh, external factors is the regional and sub-regional uh, integration process, particularly as in community 2015, as in vision 2025, and also ADMEC, building ADMEC connect by 2015. 23. The internal factors, I think many of you know that we got good data in 2014, and that give a high hands for uh, the government to include uh, whatsoever that the government would like to implement into the national uh, and strategic plan. The pass away of King Rama 9 in 2016 also provide legitimacy for the government to, you know, promote SEP. The challenges for the future, challenges for the future is that First, this we share with Indonesia, and I think we also share with other Southern providers, that is the aid architecture is still very fragmented. And the key question is that whether we should have a single coordinating body, a unifying body between Taika and NIDA. We also look at the experience of Japan when Japan, uh, you know, uh, merged. Jaika and JBIC together, we also know that there were several uh, challenges on that. So this is the big question for us in the future. The second point is to scaling up uh, you know, the scale, scope, and also uh, to secure the finance for the future. The approach, the point is that uh, whether we should provide, you know, uh, development assistance through regional platform much more than we are doing now, particularly if we are going to promote the regional cooperation. Impact assessment, I think this is the key issue uh, for Thailand for a long time. In order to scaling up, uh, 
I, and also promote effectiveness. I think we really need the monitoring evaluation mechanism and standardized data collection system. Almost all last. Then that's the, the part that I review Thailand as the provider. Now, if we are going to look at Thailand in ASEAN as the driver for South-South cooperation in, in ASEAN Regional Development Cooperation, um, the um, report that I got actually was done by uh, ASEAN, uh, actually it was done by Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand in collaboration with ASEAN Secretariat and also UN uh, OSSC. Uh, it was indicated in, in the paper that South-South uh, cooperation practice has aligned with the uh, regional integration of ASEAN through several aspects of cooperation among members, including trade, investment, aid. And South-South cooperation e practice in form of development assistance actually have helped to lessen the development gap between ASEAN 6 and ASEAN 4, in particular, the connectivity and capacity building. But the situation that we are facing now is there is increasing number of providers among ASEAN 6. These may lead to competitive environment among providers, as well as duplication of its program and projects in the recipient country. So even uh, Thailand look at the you know, South-South cooperation as the potential and also significant tools uh, for regional uh, realization process of ASEAN. Uh, several challenges still exist. First, there is no regional coordination body. Second, not enough available data for impact assessment, not only from Thailand, but I think even from Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and also Vietnam. Unpredictable sources of funding for scaling up scope and size of the program and project later. And then less proportion of development cooperation provided to regional scheme. Then the way out. If Thailand would like to promote more, what I propose is, of course, more proportion of development cooperation provide through regional frameworks such as ADMEC and others should be done. Of course, this is the key issue that we have to debate in the future uh, because it means what, what perspective we look at this form from the national perspective or from the regional perspective. Uh, one progress from Thai side is ADMEC and ADMEC fund. I think many of you know that Thai government provide 200 million US dollar, you know, within five years uh, to be a fund for, uh, you know, support each other in, in um, the, the region. The second one, what I propose is also the ASEAN Coordinating Office for South-South Cooperation. It may be able to attach with TAIGA or maybe attach with other bodies uh, among ASEAN bodies that we already have a lot for this organization to coordinate, to be a coordinating unit among providers within the region and also negotiate with provider outside the region. The second point may be uh, to work a lot on uh, you know, regional data collection and also monitoring and evaluation uh, system to scaling up and, you know, uh, access the impact of development cooperation. Thank you, Ka. Thank you very much, Dr. Siripon. I understand you combined the two presentation, one on Thailand and the other on ASEAN centrality in your yeah. 15, 20 minutes presentation. Thank you very much for your <laughs> Uh, apologies for my time management. So we have only nine minutes to go. So we have lots of questions, but I think I can give only one to each presenter, and I give two minutes each uh, to one of uh, each one of you. So Dr. Huang, uh, uh, to you, I am asking you about your uh, institutional ar arrangements because there are many questions on this. Yes. W which organization yes, in you. Vietnamese government? Uh, my answer to the old question, I think that's uh, five, five, six questions uh, relating to my uh, presentation. Yes, and, um, and can, you, can you quickly answer to the uh, question the on question, the uh, organization? On, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, about the five, six questions uh, asking about the, 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 the name of the ODI or something as a name. Exactly, in Vietnam, we usually call that development assistant. But somehow we also can use that ODI officer. But uh, the most uh, uh, time we use is that assistant to Laos like and Cambodia. Mm -hmm. yeah. And somehow similar to ODI, but uh, to be exact, that the assistant, uh, some, and uh, sometimes we call that development assistant. 
And uh, for uh, the people ask about uh, Vietnam uh, Investment Development Bank providing loan to third countries, I don't think uh, so that because all the loans, the loan is that's not the loan to countries, uh, just a loan to enterprise or uh, the, a company, but uh, through that cooperation assistance just through the government. Maybe government asks some organization to provide that, depend on the, which organization government choose. And uh, the question about South-South um, um, cooperation with India, I think that it's a very, very interesting question that India is having the ex policy before that look East policy now under Modi, that ex policy, that Vietnam is very important country in South Asia for India to, to implement the ex policy that we also have a very good cooperation assistant, cooperation uh, uh, with, uh, with, with India. And I think that India also, it's important, maybe important, some, somehow important uh, partner of Vietnam in the process of exchanging that uh, different assistance. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, finally, the government body. Who's yeah, the government it? body that uh, it, it depends almost that um, the, the loans, is, uh, the, the assistance is channeled through government, but government may um, design some uh, uh, organization to to manage it to 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 govern it like a uh, ministry of uh, planning and investment and somehow that um, some other ministries that relative few that Vietnam provide loan to other country maybe ministry of um, environmental and uh, thank you thank you very much yeah, sorry given you. the limitation yeah. of time I'm going to uh, go to Mr Helmawa. And uh, the, the most popular question here is uh, mm -hmm. the Indonesian ODA, I mean Indonesian uh, policy towards uh, Myanmar after the after the attempted coup. Uh, so can you quickly answer to that question? And I also have a question. Uh, I also like the question of which uh, country you uh, are using as a model for Indonesian AIT. So two questions to Dr. Helmon, please. Okay, the second one, please. Uh, first, uh, yeah, uh, we explore, in my understanding, uh, in 2016, 2017, I think we explore different kind of institution. So luckily we got support from JICA, we got support from, uh, from uh, GIZ, also USA. All uh, we learn from, uh, this uh, emerging uh, old donors, traditional donors about the structures, about the function, responsibility, and so many things. Uh, but the key point that we learn from this old traditional donors, the uh, the institution must be independent, autonomous, and can do kind of investment mm -hmm. of endowment fund. That that's the key point. So like corporate, <laughs> uh, like corporate, uh, uh, the, the government provides state budget in the most endowment fund which is around 200 something million uh, uh, US dollars. And then the responsibility of institution is uh, to invest it, to invest the, the money. Yeah. So if by uh, within three, four years, I think we, uh, we have you know, sufficient money you know, every year to provide funding for, uh, provide funding for uh, the SSC or international development corporation in general. So three, uh, three uh, models I think we have. Also, we learn from Mexico, ABC, mm. uh, Brazil, I see, I see. Uh, and Taika, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the question I asked, actually, a uh, few, few weeks ago to the government, so which model of, of uh, IBC? And the answer is Koika. Koika is oh. Korean. <laughs> uh, well, actually, we, we learn about uh, the success in Koika. But anyway, at the end, it's up to Indonesian government. Uh, the institution should uh, look at the regulation, mm -hmm. uh, authority, and we actually have two format, ideal format. But actually, we cannot make it. Um, yeah, um, uh, the point, uh, the point that uh, the point that uh, the budget should be, uh, we, we should have more and more uh, funding for that. That's the key, and the uh, the uh, allocation of the funding in the end should. Uh, in line to be in line with the government policy about Myanmar. Very quick on Myanmar. Luckily, the pandemic, COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, we used to have cooperation on education like TFED, also uh, decentralization policy. Uh, so uh, we invited uh, teachers from Myanmar to go to Indonesia and uh, also the education on TFED. It was in 2016, uh, 2017. We, we could do that. But uh, because of the pandemic COVID, of course, we, we cannot do that. What we can do is, uh, is of course, online. 
will there be impact the coup the coup on uh, i have not discussed about that but uh, of course all ministry will uh, listen to the decision by minister ministry of foreign affairs and our president has been very tough yeah, uh, to call for serious issues uh, in uh, in myanmar uh, you know what that means because the president already say please uh, uh, be mindful with the situation in Myanmar, which means mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this understanding. Yeah, uh, we will wait and see the, until the situation gets settled. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay I don't good. know whether there is a, a program now, but that's yes, uh, yes. what can I say, advice and I know. Yes, you, okay, good. Thank you. So it's to be seen as well. So, Dr. Siripon, finally, uh, I think yes. there's a big question about uh, the ASEAN framework seems to be helping uh, member states to solve many issues, but uh, not, not many countries are using it. What is the challenge that m not many countries are using ASEAN framework? Uh, what do you mean by framework? ASEAN cooperation, ASEAN, uh, the regional framework? Uh, yeah, it's existing ASEAN regional framework. Uh, okay, actually, there are many, many, you know, uh, ASEAN regional frameworks. And uh, as I said, uh, in case of Thailand, for example, we, we don't use uh, ASEAN regional framework. Uh, country mm -hmm. goes to the bilateral or even multilateral. I think this is the, the debate between the perspective, uh, how the country look at South-South cooperation as the national policy tool you know mm -hmm. or look from the regional cooperation and we look at you know the the what should i say uh, the tool to strengthen the region or the tool to serve the national interest and i think uh, it's hard to the government to justify that okay mm -hmm. from now on we should promote more on regional cooperation i think now thailand particularly from uh admec point of view we trying to do that you know and we start to invest uh you know the the fund for that but of course still a long way to go there are several uh issues coming up so that we have to think about uh i will talk about that a bit uh in the conclusion cut if i have time <laughs> i don't know whether <laughs> i have time <laughs> no no i think uh we are running out of time so i'm gonna ask uh yeah. for this but but i think that that gives us many insights and i think uh i understand that this uh, combination of regional and the bilateral or national uh, and yeah. how we can combine the uh, how, we, how we can use ASEAN as a regional framework would be, I think, yeah. a big question for the research team as well. So I think yeah. I'm looking yeah. forward to the future conversation on this. Yeah, thank you. Ha. Sorry, so thank you very much for Mr. your contribution, Mr. Mr. Ritaro. Yes, can you give me one minute more? Because one minute, question, please. Yes, we are, uh, yes. The question about the motivation of Vietnam. And ah, that's also very yeah, yes. very one important. Minute, please. Really. Yeah, I think that. Uh, um, people may know that Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia have very special equity relationship, and we have many agreements in uh, signing, uh, in fostering a relationship between three countries. And uh, Vietnam is uh, providing uh, um, assistance to Laos and Cambodia just in within that uh, try to promote development and cooperation among three countries and to make the reason for peace, stability, and uh, but um, independent from other, more independent from other countries to make that solid that mm. among three countries, there's mm. no any other motivation behind that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we can are I, running I, out of can I put yes, one final sentence? words, please. Yeah, uh, final words. I think, uh, you know, it is under the situation of, uh, let's say, as uh, Chika Sensei talk about the competition among external uh, providers, I think in order to promote ASEAN centrality, it is really important for providers in ASEAN, I mean, six ASEAN providers to think about the utilization of ASEAN frameworks, you know, because we have many frameworks and it's will strengthen our position when we go to the field, I mean, in reference of the development cooperation. So I think uh, it's a time, you know, to see and design, the, you know, the way that we can uh, use the uh, regional framework. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, apologies for the, my time management and time is already up. But I, 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 we, we all find that there is a, a lot of interest.
and a lot of things to, to be discussed. And uh, this research project is very, very important. We are looking forward uh, to the future conversations. So, Shiga-san, the final words are uh, for you, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, um, Rutanitsan, for your very uh, nice, nice ar ar arrangement and time management. Yeah, so my reflection is that we should have uh, more time to discuss the whole, uh, whole things, uh, whole issues. Because there are so yes. many, so many uh, interesting questions, there's so many interesting issues. So thank you again uh, for uh, Dr. Huang, uh, Dr. Hermawa, yes. and Dr. Silipon for your very informative and stimulating presentation. And also I'm very much thankful for the audience who activated the discussion by raising uh, many critically important uh, questions of common interest. Well, today we discussed the realities of uh, ASEAN emerging donors in the changing landscape of development cooperation in this region. And I think there are two main messages. One is quite encouraging, whereas uh, the other is not so encouraging. Firstly, we are encouraged by uh, the fact that the activities of uh, emerging donors, so-called emerging donors in ASEAN region are gaining momentum. Dr. Hermann's uh, comment that Indonesia is motivated by new moral responsibility as a middle income country. And Dr. Huan's uh, expression of Vietnamese a strong commitment to provide uh, South-South cooperation to its neighboring countries are quite encouraging. But at the same time, I found that there are uh, so many challenges ahead for uh, uh, ASEAN providers of uh, development cooperation. And one is the institutionalization problem of having a streamlined effective aid agency as uh, processively discussed by uh, Professor Siripon. And the other issue I would like to raise is that generally speaking, bilateral aid agencies, including JICA, tend to prefer its autonomy, partly because they want to show their national flag and partly because the coordination process with other donors is so time consuming, so stressful and so cumbersome. I can tell you with my own experience. However, as Silicon Sensei said, that it is definitely, definitely necessary for new donors in ASEAN region to coordinate and cooperate in order to enhance aid effectiveness and to achieve Asian centrality in development cooperation. So, hence our next task is to come up with the concrete policy prescription, policy recommendations to facilitate ASEAN centrality, such as a plan to establish the coordinating office of South-South cooperation in, 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 in ASEAN or like that as Shiripon Sensei proposed. So we hope that we would have another chance, another opportunity to present our final product of our joint research. So anyway, I hope that you have enjoyed today's webinar. So thank you so much for all of, all of the participants and presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so very much. much. Thank you very and much. Uh, thank you very much for all the uh, audience uh, for joining us. And uh, we really enjoyed the conversation and all three presenters. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. And I think we are receiving a lot of positive feedbacks from all over the world, actually, joining this webinar. And we are receiving a higher expectations for your future uh, analysis and the conversations. And I think we are in a new world where we can communicate uh, with, uh, with this uh, virtual meetings. And in, at the same time, it's a new world where more and more Asian countries are joining in the international cooperation. And we, we, we would like to create a new world where we can uh, benefit from each other more actively and, uh, and more actively. So thank you. Thank you very much for all the input. And we really looking look forward for the future conversation. Thank you, thank you very much. much. And we are yeah, closing this uh, session. Yeah, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. See you. I look forward to seeing you in Tokyo.
Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is the hope. Yeah, we need the opportunity to do so that. So I'm look. Uh, okay. I, I am looking forward to receiving you in Hanoi. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we definitely need more. I mean, deeper conversation yeah. with a longer time. So yeah. look forward to do that. Yeah, Thank, you, Thank you. You are also recommended to join. Yeah. yeah Thank so you for the invitation. Is, Thank you. Yeah, all of it. Welcome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Look bye forward. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. So we are closing the event. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Bye.